When we moved into this house in rural Mid Wales many years ago, we always wanted a beautiful spot to sit just outside the house. Somewhere we could soak up some sun, the property is south facing, enjoy the views, eat al fresco on fair weather days and take in the sights and scents of the plants we plan to grow. Our dream patio was a few years coming as we had more urgent building and renovation works to see to first, but finally we put our plans into action and the new patio was built. Since then, it has evolved over the years as we have experimented with new pots, plants, garden furniture and arrangements, but it has always been our little patch of paradise just outside the front door. This video will show the planning, design and build of the patio, plus the many varied plantings of our patio pots and containers over the years. Let's start at the beginning, life before the new patio. When we moved into our small neglected house and garden all those years ago, there was just a scrappy lawn and an uneven stretch of old concrete slabs in front of the house. The narrow paved area was just about functional as a hard surface leading up to the front door. Slabs didn't even match each other. The area wasn't the slightest bit beautiful at that point, but we knew it had potential. The house is south facing and a bit of a sun trap, even on the coldest winter days, it would eventually be the perfect spot for our dream patio. So for the first few years, as the house was renovated, we scribbled ideas and rough sketches on the backs of envelopes and drew up plant lists to keep our hopes and dreams alive. As the time grew closer to the moment when we could start ripping out the old slabs and laying a new patio, we drew up more detailed plans. We had by this point had a small extension built on the east end of the house, which allowed us to slightly increase the size of our patio layer. The patio now included a narrow strip 1.85 metres wide by 11.13 metres long in front of the original house, with a semicircular section 5.18 metres long and 4.14 metres at its widest point. Building a solid long-lasting patio was beyond our abilities at that point, so we asked the builder of our extension if he could step in and assist. Colin's first job was to rip out the old slabs. It was very satisfying seeing them go and knowing this was the first step to achieve our dream patio. But at that stage the site looked even uglier with bare earth and bits of broken cement scattered everywhere. One of the big decisions in our planning phase was what materials to use to make the new patio. The choice back then was more limited than now and we didn't feel brash new concrete slabs would blend well into the rural setting. We were also keen to recycle old materials if possible. We had always admired the old Victorian blue brick pavement in our local town. After some research we were pleased to find a supply of these bricks at an architectural salvage yard an hour's drive away. Some of the old blue bricks had criss-cross diamond patterns on them. There were fewer of these. We decided to combine the two styles of Victorian bricks with several of the old slabs we had lifted. Once cleaned up the old slabs didn't look too bad. We incorporated them into the design in strips which we repeated along the length of the patio, bordering the slabs with the criss-cross bricks to great effect. Well, we thought so anyway. The blue bricks were also used to build the steps leading up from the patio to our drive. These steps would tie in neatly with the new dry stone walls we were stacking to create terraces in our hillside garden. Colin was a fast worker and it didn't take long for the new patio to be laid once the design was agreed. First job once the old slabs had been removed was to thoroughly clean up the area down to a depth of about 15 centimetres below the final patio level, also ensuring it was well below the property damp course. Then using a plate compactor, Colin compressed the whole area to create a solid base. A layer of hardcore followed, about 5 to 7 centimetres of crushed rock, and again this was raked and compacted, which stopped it moving around while the bricks were laid. Colin then began laying the reclaimed bricks and slabs from the west end of the patio, starting with the bricks next to the property. The bricks were laid onto a mortar bed and then tamped down with a rubber mallet. A one centimetre gap was left between the bricks and the slabs, which was filled in later with mortar. To allow rainwater to drain freely from the surface, Colin used a spirit level and built in a slight gradient on the patio. The usual recommendation is for a drop of 1 in 60 or 17 millimetres per metre. The water runs away from 
the house and into the surrounding gravel garden. A day or two later, the gaps in between the bricks were filled with mortar using a pointing trowel, being careful not to get the mortar onto the bricks as it might stain. A pointing iron can be used to smooth the mortar. The whole surface was then well washed down and once the mortar had set was ready to use. It looked absolutely stunning. Once the patio was finished, we soon chose some new garden furniture to make the most of our new outdoor space. We picked a circular wooden table with four matching chairs for outdoor dining. Timber was Forest Stewardship Council certified, which meant that it was sourced from a forest responsibly managed. The parasol, to keep off the heat of the day, was a surprise birthday present. During spring and summer, we regularly eat lunch outdoors on dry days, and it's the perfect spot to invite family and friends to join us to share our beautiful outdoor space. Then the other essential piece of furniture is a small garden bench positioned just outside the front door. This is definitely the most used seat in our entire garden as it's so easy to reach. It's perfect for short work breaks for sitting and admiring the view or watching the birds, catching the scent of nearby plants such as sweet peas and also ideally placed for taking off shoes or wellies so long as it isn't too wet to sit on. There are also two small wooden seats for additional guests which can be moved around the patio as required. Once the weather turns each autumn we pack up our table and chairs in a shed until the following spring to help preserve them for as long as possible. Winters in Wales can be very wet. The original table had to be replaced during the Covid pandemic as despite winter storage and regular treatment with a varnish every year the wood did eventually rot. We managed to find a very similar looking table as a replacement. The original chairs are still hanging on. We're very impressed. The bench by the front door stays out in all weathers. It is a little sheltered by an overhanging mature wisteria and regularly varnished. The patio is, of course, the perfect place to showcase pots and containers bursting with plants. We have tried many different types of containers and pots over the years, some with better success than others. Terracotta pots. Plants look absolutely gorgeous in terracotta pots. We love them with their beautiful red fired clay. Unfortunately, they do not love the Welsh climate. A combination of heavy rain and occasional hard frosts through the winter season quickly destroys these pots which just begin to disintegrate. Even those which claim to be frost proof usually only last a few seasons here. We usually have a few dotted around the patio, excepting though that they will be just short lived before needing to be replaced. Broken up they make good crocks for drainage at the bottom of other pots. Glazed pots. Glazed pots however last much longer with their protective glaze. Over the years we've built up a collection of more heavy duty glazed pots in all different sizes. Many others were presents. They too can look gorgeous once planted up. We try to keep colours muted and themed. Greys, rusty reds, blues and muted greens are our favourite colour combinations. Galvanised metal containers. Galvanised metal containers are another of our go-to options for patio pots. As a natural material, metal fits in well with our wild rural garden and can last many years. Some of our galvanised pots are reclaimed fire or mop buckets. Old watering cans and galvanised bathtubs are perfect for potting up too. Catering oil drums. Inspired by European displays in courtyards and on window ledges, we decided to try a very cheap option, recycling old catering oil drums as plant containers. The cost is a big plus. They are free. We just collect a supply from our local takeaway restaurants once the old ones rust away after a few years. They add colour and variety to the patio and always get commented on by visitors. The 20 litre versions work best for us as they hold plenty of compost and so dry out less frequently. Concrete troughs. We recently inherited some old concrete troughs which, because they are quite weathered, actually look pretty good on the patio. One has been planted up as a small rock garden and has thrived. Half whiskey barrels. Half whiskey barrels make ideal containers for us here. They last for years, look wonderful with the combination of wood and rusty metal hoops and keep contents damp for longer due to their larger size. They're ideal for small shrubs such as our favourite hydrangea, Little Lime. The main disadvantage is that once full of compost, the half barrels are virtually impossible to move, so it's important to decide on a permanent spot for them before planting up. All our pots have dry drainage holes. Those that come without, such as the catering oil drums and recycled mop buckets, have holes pierced into their base using a hammer and large nail.
Over the years, we've experimented with many different plants and bulb combinations in our pots. Some perennials, annuals, including bedding plants, bulbs and grasses, even small shrubs. Every year is different, depending not only on plant choices, but also weather conditions. But that's the beauty of a garden, it's ever-changing. There are always a few disappointments, but the surprises and delights far outweigh these. Some plants, like sweet peas and tobacco plants, are chosen specifically for scent. Here are some of our favourite plant combinations from over the years. Creeping thyme has spread onto a section of the rounded patio area from an adjacent garden bed. It clearly likes the heat given off by the bricks and also, being a Mediterranean plant, a lack of moisture at its roots during the winter. It has thrived with no attention whatsoever, other than an occasional weeding to remove seeded grasses, hardy geraniums and other tiny seedlings. It looks absolutely stunning when it flowers in June and is fairly tolerant of being trodden on too. Watering container plants is a big commitment throughout the summer months, even in mid Wales, which is renowned for its damp climate. Even during wet spells, water often does not penetrate well into the pots, so top-ups are required. We mainly water by hand. Early in the season, we use watering cans whilst plants are still establishing. Later on, during hotter, drier weather, we do use our garden hose occasionally with a lance attachment for ease of use. There is an external tap on one of our house walls, adjacent to the patio for easy access to water. We also recycle grey water from our kitchen to water pots, especially during drought conditions, which seem more common now in UK summers. We use a mix of homemade compost, garden soil and sand to make the growing medium for our patio pots. Pots are refreshed with a new mix each year. Even those with perennials are topped up with fresh compost. Later on in the season, mid-July perhaps, we add chicken manure in the form of pellets to the top of the pots as a general purpose feed which is watered in by rain or by us. It is a useful source of nitrogen but also contains smaller amounts of phosphorus and potassium. We had a spare half whiskey barrel and decided to experiment with a small water feature on the patio next to the bench. The barrel was lined with butyl pond liner decorated with pebbles and topped up with water. The water stays clear much of the time. We add in a small bag of barley straw to help keep algae at bay. The biggest issue with a water feature is trying to stop all the leaves falling in during autumn. It's right underneath a mature wisteria. Which leads nicely into our next topic, climbing plants. The patio is adjacent to our house walls along one entire side, which gives ample opportunity for growing climbers. This way, the patio feels as if it is wrapped in leaves and flowers, which almost completely disguise the building. The wisteria has been here for many years years and looks glorious when in full bloom in late spring. Late frosts can be an issue but even then the wisteria will often repeat flower later in the season. Clematis also feature alpine and viticella along with honeysuckle. There is an enormous Cotoniaster horizontalis which, like the wisteria, has to be regularly tamed or else it would take over. But the bees absolutely adore it in spring. Recently a climbing rose, Handel, has excelled on the wall overlooking the outside dining area. Our patio planting is at its peak in late spring and summer, but there is interest through all the seasons. Spring. We know spring has arrived when the first spring bulbs break through. Daffodils and irises are followed by tulips, which we treat as spring bedding here, as squirrels and bank bulbs have acquired a taste for those we plant in the garden beds. Summer. Where to start? So much is flowering throughout the summer. We particularly like shades of orange, 
dusky red, purple and white with the odd blue thrown in. The scent of sweet pea high scent is glorious by the front door early on and Lily Lollipop is at its peak. By late summer, love lies bleeding, cosmos and petunias are blooming madly and the hydrangea, little lime, flowers from now on through to late autumn, creating a stunning feature. The patio is the perfect place to dry out freshly harvested potatoes before storing them for the winter. Autumn. Bright red berries of Cotoniaster pull in birds from all directions, particularly blackbirds. The summer bedding will keep flowering through to mid-autumn if we are lucky and don't have an early frost. Fleece can help protect tender plants and extend the season too. The grasses are at their peak. We love steeper tenuissima blowing in the breeze. Winter. During the winter months, structure is maintained through evergreens close to the house, such as rosemary and fatsia japonica. We leave grasses and seed heads as they are beautiful in their own right and provide food for passing birds. Violas are fairly hardy and introduce some colour during the darker months. And then come late January, the first self-seeded snowdrops pop up in our pots. Occasionally, snow will carpet the patio during winter and turn it into a winter wonderland. A good spring clean always brings the patio back to life after a long winter. Gales and rain usually leave the pots mounded in leaves which all have to be cleared away eventually and then the patio is hosed down and the pots emptied and refreshed. The new season is planned, seeds bought and sown, some have been saved from previous years and donated by family and friends. Occasionally old pots will be retired or turned into crocs and new ones acquired to fill the gaps. It's always really exciting growing fresh summer bedding or trying different perennials for a change. Over time, the original mortar between the bricks will eventually crumble away in places. Wildflowers quickly move in if allowed. Some are left. Daisies look really pretty flowering away between the bricks. And procumbent pearlwort just loves to grow in the cracks. It looks pretty when freshly green, so we leave it. But others have to be removed before they take over. Moss is another swift arrival and can be left in odd corners, but scraped out if causing a slip hazard. The reclaimed blue bricks can be a bit slippy in the wet if algae starts to grow. Algae can be an issue on any hard surface. We scrub the bricks with soapy water to remove it. We've never used any other cleaning agent on the patio. Bird poop is unavoidable now and again and we clean this up especially when it lands on the garden furniture. Fine weevils can be an issue in container gardening. The white grubs eat the roots of plants which gradually weakens them and then eventually kills them. If, when clearing out a pot, we find vine weevils, we empty the pot entirely, remove the weevil grubs and feed them to the birds. The old compost is then replaced with fresh. Snails and slugs are guaranteed to put in regular appearances, especially during wet spells and can be very damaging to young plants. They like to hide beneath pots during the day and emerge at night to snack away. We tolerate a few, but if they get out of control, we go out at dusk and collect them in buckets. Thrushes love to eat slugs and snails, so we spread them on a grassy patch next to some rocks, well away from the patio. Lily beetles also appear on our lilies every year. They're very pretty, but will soon devastate lily plants unless picked off and fed to the birds. Creating our patio paradise turned out to be one of the best things we ever did in our garden. This beautiful small space never fails to cheer us through all the months of the year and is the closest thing we have to an outdoor room. In spring and summer we spend more time here than in our house, that's for sure. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching, watching and, and happy, happy patio, patio gardening, gardening all. all.